Today we have Britt on the podcast and we're going to talk about how Britt changed his approach to treatment the second time round, how to use music to overcome addiction and the work Britt does as a recovery coach and lots, lots more. But before we get into the show, I want to thank our audience for listening and I want to let you know that you can take the next step in your journey by downloading my free ebook. You can learn seven practical tools to build a solid mental foundation and get your drink and drug use under control. Just go to insideaddiction.co.uk forward slash foundation. Now on to the show. Welcome, Britt. It's great to have you on the podcast. Hey, Lou. Thanks for having me. Good, great to be here. Awesome, thank you. So to kick us off, I just wondered what advice would you give to the version of yourself that is still stuck in the madness, or that was still stuck in the madness, should I say, you know, drinking and using drugs, and where were you at the time, and what was going on for you? Uh, I think the, the two things I would really want to say to my former self um, is that... Life without drugs and alcohol is not as bad as you think it's going to be. Uh, it's actually so much better than life with drugs and alcohol. Um, that is probably the first thing I would say, because I was very afraid that I was going to no longer be able to have any fun or have any more excitement or adventure in my life, that I wasn't going to be creative, I wasn't going to be along with people. Um, you know, that, that was my fear. And, these fears have been rather unfounded as I progress on this journey of recovery. Um, but another thing I would say is to, you know, really kind of drill into my former self's head that that I'm just a sick person dealing with a, a brain illness, a mental illness, and that I'm not really the person that you know is doing all the things that I was doing in my you know using days. Um, that you know, you're just a sick kid, you're just a sick young guy, and um, because I remember when I went to treatment the last time, um, I had a counselor really say that to me, like I was having a hard time kind of getting past the shame and the guilt of some of the things that I had done, and he was like, "Man, you're just a sick." A sick guy, and you know, for some reason, I've heard that before. You know, addictions are disease, and they get it all the time. And I just had never, you know, stopped to think about it, or I just kind of dismissed it. But when I actually let those words settle in and really take hold and think of them, think about it for a while, it made a lot of sense to me. And plus, I was getting a lot of good scientific information about the disease of addiction and really starting to understand it, you know, rationally and logically, but, you know also you know, internally. So those kind of that was a pivotal moment. So I think I would tell my former self to just go easy on yourself and just realize that you're sick and that there's a way to get better. Yeah. And I think a lot of people have this sort of fear, especially in the creative sort of space and area of life, whether it's like music and art and all that kind of stuff. But that if they stop drinking or using drugs that they can't be creative or they can only be creative if they drink or use drugs. I just wonder what the difference was for you between, like you say, having that belief of well, life won't be fine, I won't be able to have that adventure, versus now of what you do and your creativity and how that sort of shifted. Yeah, it's shifted a great deal for me because, and I'm not saying that people can't have creative experiences under the influence of mind and with all altering substances. In fact, I'm sure. Some you know the best music that some of the best music we've heard has been from people who are under the influence of you know psychedelics and whatever. Um, but for me, you know, I just was kind of like a lush drinker and user. Like I wouldn't. I mean, to, to produce music, especially you know, kind of on your own, um, it takes a lot of work. I mean, it's very it, it's physically, emotionally, and psychologically exhausting. Um, you're, you're getting hit with all lots of sounds, you know, and it kind of, there's such thing as called listening fatigue, and, you know, it can mess with your, your judgment of how you perceive sounds and stuff like that. So for me, I realized that if I take care of, like, this body, like this vessel, and, like this my brain, like, these are going to be where the music comes from. My ideas can only come from one source, and that's within me. 
So if I take care of myself, you know, I meditate, I work out, I try to eat right, um, you know, yoga, and if I do all these things and take care of my psychological well-being, the spiritual well-being, the physical well-being, I can have faith that the the ideas and the, the music that's coming from me is coming from an authentic, healthy place. You know what I mean? And and it might it will go all over the place, like as far as emotions, like it won't always be like happy or feel good music. But I know that I'm not trying to create an artificial circumstance for me to put out music, like I, I would be say if I was using drugs or something, or if I'm trying to just copy another artist, you know, or or try to sound like somebody else, like really trying to stay true to my own sound, my own music. And I wondered if you could take us back and rewind a bit to the beginning and let us know what your story was like growing up, how was your childhood for you, and what kind of led into your sort of drinking um, at the age that you sort of started and when things became problematic? Yeah, I think, I mean, my, my childhood was, you know, I couldn't have asked for a better one. I'm super grateful for my upbringing, my family, and, you know, obviously, no family is perfect, I don't think. Um, you know, everybody in my family is pretty high achieving. They have a high standard of, you know, of how they want to act and how they want to, you know, everybody, you know, want to do the right thing and, 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 you know, do good in school and all that. Like, that was, I got the impression that that was kind of the standard, you know, as I was coming up. And... I think I was just a very, very curious kid, and I was always willing to, like, try some sort of new novel experience. I would stay up, you know, sneak out past my bedtime. I would, you know, probably, like, watch TV shows that I wasn't supposed to watch, listen to music that I wasn't supposed to listen to when I was younger. And I think that kind of behavior, that kind of personality that I had really lended itself to trying, you know, drinking and drugs at a younger age, you know, 14, 15, I probably drank for the first time, and I had an unbelievable experience for the first 45 minutes, because I didn't really know what I was doing, I raised my parents' liquor cabinet, because that was, like, the next kind of daring, kind of adventurous thing to do, and I got real sick after, like, a really blissful 45 minutes, but my brain only remembered those really was for 45 minutes. I was funny, I was charming, I was you know, I had a lot of energy, I was laughing. And I I kind of forgot the being really sick part and almost getting into trouble. And um that's just kind of like how it started for me. I just I I always knew in the back of my head that there was this thing I could go do. I could go use like drink. And at first it was alcohol, then it became marijuana. And the cocaine pills and harder, harder drugs as I got older and older. But after that first time getting drunk in the back of my brain, I always knew I could run to that. I always knew I could go to that place. And it was like on the weekends at first, just because I, I, I played sports and I was happy in high school. So I didn't drink during the week. But on the weekends, like I would always look forward to those, that, that moment where I could just like boom and escape, you know? And for me, you know, I had, you know, like I said, a really good upbringing, a lot of friends, good friends in, in high school, and was going to, went to college right out of, uh, right out of high school, and I didn't, I didn't really want to be there as far as, like, academically, socially, I wanted to be there, and I felt like that's what I was supposed to do, because that's what everybody did, um, but I didn't really know what I wanted to study, I didn't, I wasn't that great at school back then, I just had other interests, and I wish I would have just expressed that more honestly that, uh, hey, I don't really want to be here in school. Um, but, you know, I tried to, like, I tried to do both. I tried to play music and be this a very social person. But then, you know, one of the, the, thing, one of the things that was going to start to suffer was my grades. So I, I got out of school and college the first time around. And, um, and there, just tried to pursue a, a, a music career full time. I traveled a little bit. I traveled to South America and lived in Nicaragua and did some humanitarian work for a while. Um, 
and try to get away from some stressful circumstances. I was back at my hometown. Uh, but as soon as I got back, you know, I was still doing the same things, drinking too much, partying too much, and things just became unmanageable really quickly again. About mid twenties there, yeah. Yeah. And what did your kind of, um, or did you have a rock bottom at all, or what did that look like? When did things sort of become problematic for you? Yeah, um, I think whatever the age is that the 27 Club, I think is what, what it's called, when we're like Jim Morrison and Jimi Hendrix, the age that all them, Kurt Cobain, like all of them passed away or something. I remember like I was that age, and I think my dad maybe said something to me about that. <clears throat> and it was, I mean, it was apparent to everybody else that I had a real problem, but I think when, when I was 27, I was, it's when it dawned on me that I had a real problem too. And, you know, I, I just kind of like realized that it wasn't something I was going to grow out of. You know, it was just, it was this thing that I was dealing with that was kind of bigger than I was. So I finally asked for help when I was 27. Um, my family and I, we didn't really know like what to do, where to turn. So we, you know, found some treatment centers online and started calling them. And we found one uh, was pretty close by. And, you know, I went and that was like the scariest thing I had ever done up to that point in my life. I was so petrified of <clears throat> having to go in there and people getting to know the real me, like the inside part, like all the stuff that I did from everybody else my whole life, you know, and that was terrifying. And I got there and I wasn't quite ready to completely like give all of all of myself to recovery and to people and to like, you know what I'm saying? The things that it required me, like I required to completely like, commit everything I had to recovery in order for me to be successful at it. But I wasn't ready to do that the first time in treatment. So I went for the six weeks. They tried to tell me to go to a halfway house and all that stuff. And I was like, okay, I'll just give me a meeting with us of AA and NA meetings. And I'll go to them when I go back down to Orlando, Florida. Because I was living in Orlando going to recording our school, which was a dream of mine. And I had worked my ass off to get into school there. But as soon as I got back, I relapsed in pretty spectacular fashion. Um, I failed out of school there. I got into a high-speed chase with police, blacked out under the influence, uh, went through the windshield of the car, you know, woke up in the hospital, handcuffed to the bed. You know, I thankfully it didn't, didn't hurt anyone else. Um, but that kind of started, um, you know, a parade of legal troubles. I mean, I had been arrested for like public disorderly stuff before, but that this was, I got charged with a felony at the time and um, I was put on probation, but the way I operated back then, I didn't, if there was something that required me to be responsible to go like handle it, like being on probation, I was just incapable of doing that. I just, I just, I moved out of state and just pretended that the probation would just go away if I just ignored it. <laughs> <laughs> so I kind of ran, ran from that for a few years, but all the while I was in and out of treatment centers and, um, you know, in outpatient programs and stuff like that. And I started getting involved in some harder drugs and trafficking drugs. And um, that was some rather dark parts of, of my story. Um, and, you know, kind of bounced in and out of, out of recovery and, playing music. Our music was kind of doing pretty well, but our band was playing a lot. Uh, we were touring with the Whalers, which is Bob Marley's band, and you know, playing some fun shows. And uh, but eventually, you know, that that probation stuff caught up to me. I got pulled over when I was in Charleston, South Carolina. And I had a, a, a nationwide a fugitive warrant out for my arrest because I had been on, on the run for, you know, I guess two years at that point. So I had to go turn myself in in jail in Florida for, you know, 90 days or something like that. And, you know, I had an invisible experience in jail. I like had a seizure because I was coming off with so much booze and Xanax. And uh, it was it was horrible. But like, I got out of there and that wasn't even my rock bottom. I got another DUI. And, 
went and worked at some treatments or some treatment centers some uh, that my lawyer suggested so I could just like kind of stay out of jail. And, but I kept getting kicked out of those places because I couldn't stay sober. Um, and by this point, you know, I was glad to develop like a three hundred dollar a day, you know, IV heroin habit. And it was, you know, I was somehow managed to hold down some jobs, but eventually all that stuff kind of went away and um I got into a car accident with one of my best friends. Um he got hurt pretty bad and but I told my car, I didn't have a car. I was living at home, like 30, 30 or 31 years old, living in my parents' basement with this terrible drug habit. And just like I really couldn't, I was, I was essentially just sl slowly dying and right in front of my parents. And there was, there was something inside of me that was like, you know where to go. And it told me, it was like, I knew the first treatment center I went to. That was a, it's a really, really special place. It's a great place. It's a great treatment center. So that little, whatever it was in my head was like, you got to go back to that place. You know the level of care that you'll get there. Because at this point, my body was shutting down. My liver was failing. Like, I needed serious, like, medical care. And I just, I let go. And I finally said that I was like, it's either changed my life or this is going to be my story like it's gonna be how it ends like it's gonna be one of those sad cases where you know a person you know with a lot of potential just waste you know wasted it because he couldn't he couldn't stop using and i was at that crossroads and that door just opened up on that day it's july of 2015 and i went up to treatment and I told my dad on the way up there, I said, look, if I get kicked out of here, if I screw this up, don't answer the phone when I call you. Like, I need, I, my parents were always there to bail me out, you know, and I, I manipulated them like crazy. And, and he agreed to that, and I went there, and I just, I, my tone was completely different than the first time I went there. I said, I'm willing to do anything. I'll do anything it takes to change my life. And I ended up staying in treatment for seven months, and... You know, it was just totally all in for recovery. And just to rewind a bit, like you said before that, you were kind of in and out of different treatment places and in and out, in and out of like outpatient treatment and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And I just, I just wondered what was going on for you in that time. What do you feel like didn't click? What made you feel like after the first treatment centre? that you didn't kind of get the message? What was that process like and what were some of the things that held you back, do you think? Well, man, that's such a complicated and complex situation. I mean, I had, I was kind of, this is, this, is, this is how like my addict brain thinks, but I was starting to use, you know, harder drugs in harder ways. You know, I was shooting drugs and I had just discovered like shooting heroin and shooting methamphetamine and, and while those sound, you know, it's very intense, it's very euphoric too. And this when I discovered those, I wasn't ready to quit anytime soon. You know, um, I wasn't I was like I just I just started using these like I, that's like telling somebody to, you know, you just got a brand new car but you can't drive it anymore you know like and to someone who likes to get high using those drugs in that way in those ways like that's like the ultimate so you know i think i was still young like i was younger i was or at least i was thinking younger thinking more immaturely um because i was still trying to hold on to those fun times because you know, early on you know i've had some great times partying and i was 27 28 29 30 you know, coming down the backside of my youth, you know, and it just wasn't fun anymore. It was just getting to be sad. So I, I don't think I just and I just wanted to do it my way. Like I wanted to. I, I didn't want to accept the fact that I, that I was an alcoholic, that I couldn't drink anymore, or I couldn't smoke a little weed. You know, I didn't want to. I didn't want to accept that because I always wanted to be able to at least do those things like a normal person. And that's just not how I'm put together. And I just wasn't ready to accept that back then, but I finally, like, 
at the end, I, I, I accept that about myself now. Like, I know that I'm never going to have the life that I want to have if I'm drinking and doing those kinds of drugs. Like you say, it was almost as if you were kind of running on self-will, doing it Brit's way. I don't want to kind of, you know, surrender. I just want to do it my own way. I'm not listening to anyone else. And I'm just wondering, after you kind of got out of treatment and were kind of introduced to it, what led you on to those harder drugs? Did you just, how did they kind of come into your life? Um, I think I... I just was not shy to put myself in circumstances where I would be around those drugs or hang out with people that had those drugs. It's very possible that somebody's going to pull out those drugs to use, you know? So I was, I don't think I set out with the intention of, oh my gosh, I'm going to go find someone to do heroin with. It was, I just kept putting myself in sketchier and sketchier situations, you know, where, where those, the possibility of those drugs being used was increasing each, each place I went, you know, and when circumstance meets motivation is when you, you know, if I'm motivated to, to use those types of things and the circumstance, if those intersect, then I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it. Yeah. And like you said, along the way, your parents were always kind of there for you. How do you mm-hmm. feel like that kind of helped you or hindered you along your journey? Well, you know, it's, it's, it's all the above. I mean, that, and it's so hard because I do a lot of work with families now, and it's so hard to tell family members, you know, what the best way to handle this stuff is. Is it tough love? Is it, you know, is it enabling or whatever? And I, I, I personally believe that there's no right or wrong way to do it. Um, some of this, from the textbook definition of enabling, my parents probably enabled me, but I was also very, 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 very good at, at manipulating them into thinking, you know, things were one way when they really weren't. And um, but my parents love me through it, and there's no way that I would be here with the recovery that I have without them. So you can call it whatever you want. You know, there's no right or wrong day, and I think one day calls for a certain type of love, then and then another day. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for their love and support, no doubt. And you said you drove back to kind of ground zero, the first all treatment centre, and you just had that mm-hmm. intuition and that's where you needed to be. Mm-hmm. And you, the one thing that stuck out is you said to your dad, you know, effectively cut me off, don't come and get me. If this one fails, that's it, you know, don't don't rescue me again in a sense, just leave me be. And that took a lot of courage, I'm sure. But it also kind of is like what the Vikings used to do, like burn the ships, drop me off, I'm ready, and just burn the ships and I'm going to succeed. And like you say, you stayed there for seven months. How was it to kind of burn those ships? Was that intentional? And what was that process like for you and your dad? I love that uh, analogy. That's great. I'm going to have to see that one. Um, but yeah, that was essentially what it was. And it was so funny because we were riding up together. And I think we just kind of both arrived at that conclusion at the same time. And we both kind of knew it. And we both kind of were thinking it. And I don't know who said it first, but we were both like, yep, that's how it's got to be. Because I, was, I couldn't pull them through it anymore. And they weren't doing me any favors at that point either, you know. So it just was kind of like a natural. And I'm, I'm, I'm really lucky, you know. I feel very fortunate that I kind of got, like, I didn't really have only, I had only a couple of years with those hard drugs, like that, those ways, you know, and, um, that, yeah, the life expectancy of those kind of you know, drugs is not very long, so I was, I was glad that it didn't get any further than it did, so, you know, we were both kind of at that, we were ready to burn the ship, so to speak, I love that. Awesome, and... What was it like for you those first kind of weeks, days and months in treatment, you know, the sort of final time, if you like? Oh, uh, well, I was in detox for a while. Um, I did a, like a Suboxone taper uh, for like two weeks. So my detox, it could have been much worse. I mean, it wasn't great, but I started running uh, because... There was no smoking cigarettes where I was, so the cigarettes were out. So I figured I might as well 
try to at least get back in shape. And the first few weeks, I was the only way I could sleep was if I ran that day. So I would just get on the treadmill and run like a mile and then try to go up a half a mile every other day. And eventually, that became this really important part of my recovery was the physical wellness and taking care of my body and stuff like that. Um, but, I mean, in, in the groups and stuff, I was... I think that I was finally willing to get honest and open about who I was and what I had done. And I remember that was a turning point in my recovery was being just brutally open and honest about everything. The things that I said I was going to take to the grave, I, I shared in front of a lot of people. And nothing really bad happened except... Actually, it wasn't, nothing really bad happened at all. And the only thing that really did happen was that I just felt like this huge weight was off my shoulders and I could finally begin to accept myself. And then in turn, I could finally begin to show myself some love. You know, once I accepted myself and was honest and willing to own all the things about me, I could be like, all right, it's not so bad. You know, you're not too bad of a dude. Like, you know, it's hard to shift that self-love perspective. And what were some of the ways or tools or insights you had during the process of accepting that kind of like shadow part of you? Like you say, the part of you that was perhaps filled with shame and guilt that didn't do such nice things, but that also when you showed up, honestly, you got that weight off your shoulders and you started to process those emotions. But was there anything that sticks out that helped you kind of go through that shadow part of yourself? Um, I think... My biggest crush, and you know, I don't want to go on here about my spirituality or anything, but um, because I know people who are in recovery that that, that kind of can like, like, well, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not ready to hear about God and spirituality, but um, I remember just having this sense that it was going to be all right if I could, if I told the truth. Like, I just remember thinking, like, this is kind of the thing that you have to walk through, but it's going to be fine. I just had this this feeling. And I was reading a book at the time called The Spirituality of Imperfection, and I highly recommend that book. Uh, but it, the, the gist of it is that, you know, those cracks and those those dark times is when where the light can creep in. And that's kind of where true change happens is in those dark, cracked parts. And so all that kind of aligned to give me some, some faith and trust that it was going to be all right if I got honest. And I just, man, I was so willing to do anything. Like, I, I you hear in, like, all the AA meetings and all this stuff, it's like, you know, we're only as sick as our secrets. You're only, like, honesty, open-minded willingness, you know, without... I was like, okay, these are suggestions that are being told by everybody to do this, so why not just do it? I've tried everything else. Why not <laughs> actually try the suggestions? So I did, you know, just kind of, I just played stupid for like the first 18 months. I was just like, I was like, I have no idea how to live my life. I'm just going to listen to everything that people suggest. But yeah, it's almost like flipping the script, whereas before when you were stuck in the cycle, there was that running on self-will, I'm doing it my way, I'm doing it everyone else's way, but whatever they're suggesting. And then, like you say, the first last time, in a sense, you're like, okay, I'm willing to surrender and, you know, um, just surrender and listen to everyone else, take on board that advice, do it the way that keep people keep recommending. Like you say, if everyone says it, maybe I'll actually try it. And having that kind of willingness um, yeah, and go yeah, go through that process. And like you say, go figure. It, mm -hmm. it doesn't, it's, it's insanity, but at the time it makes perfect sense in a sense. So that's why right. it's so funny being on both sides of addiction and recovery. You kind of understand why both sides make perfect sense at the same time, <laughs> which, which is just funny. Um, yeah. But yeah, I just wondered if there was any kind of mentors or any one person or people that really helped you in your journey through recovery. Yeah, I I definitely had um, a lot of people. Um, I think I had a really small but strong core group of friends, guy friends, 
I mean, we were all so still messed up in our heads, but like we were really tight. We would go do things like play trivia and we'd go on hikes. And these are the people that I stayed with at the treatment center where they lived close by and halfway houses and stuff. And I just, you know, that just gave me like a sense of normalcy. And, um, like we had fun, you know, we, we had good laughs. I mean, we were going through some really heavy stuff. And, but those, that was really important for me, finding those, those good friends that are in recovery that, that I felt like I was like, these are, these are, these are brother type people. Um, and I had some, you know, mentors, I had some spiritual mentors and I had a sponsor early on, uh, and the people in my, my home group after I, I left treatment, you know, um, those, those types of people and, you know, my, my, my parents, you know, they were so patient and willing to give me a second chance or by this time it was like the 19th chance, but they were willing to give me another chance and that was all I needed. And you spoke about peer group a lot in terms of hanging around with sketchier and sketchier dudes that introduce you to kind of harder drugs. And then on the flip side, in your recovery, hanging around with and having that kind of band of brothers, if you like, of people who were really into recovery, playing trivia, doing all the right things. How important do you think peer group is in our life and in addiction and in recovery? Uh, I mean, I don't know about other people, but uh, for me, it was it was super important and it was very surprising. I found out things about myself in recovery that I never thought to be true. I always considered myself, I always thought of myself as a pretty extroverted, you know, outgoing person. Um, I, I found that I, I, I don't really do as, I, I kind of prefer like smaller, you know, closer friends circles and not going out as much. I'm a little bit more introverted than I thought I was. I had just been using drugs and alcohol to boost the extrovert part of myself for you know, the last, 10 years. Um, but I think just finding, like, I had two or three guys, you know, like, that just became, like, they were just like my childhood friends that I, that I did, like, we got along so well, and um, it was so important for me. Um, you know, slowly, I kind of had to, like, just wipe the slate clean sort of socially. I mean, a lot of my friends, they kind of drifted off because I was a liability. They didn't want to, like, have a front row seat in my downward spiral, you know? And I just believe that people, you know, kind of can't circle back in my life that were supposed to be there. The ones that weren't supposed to be there kind of filtered out. And if I was, if I was living how I wanted to live, then that's going to attract the people that want to live similarly, you know? Um, but it can be lonely, you know, early recovery can be very lonely. I, I mean, I had a relation, I was in a relationship in early recovery, and I think that actually really helped me. Like, people were like, you're not supposed to get into relationships early on. Um, but it actually really helped me. Uh, I don't, and, and you know, I it just gave me like some confidence, it gave me some purpose. Um, it made, it made me feel like. It was, it was a good way for me to grow as a human being, you know. So I think having some sort of human connection for me was very important. I don't know how it's going to be different for everybody, but yeah, that social element was super important. What was the most worthwhile investment you made in your life? And it could be an investment of money, time, energy, or other resource. And how did you decide to make that investment? I mean, me personally, I, I mean, my, my parents were, my parents would say that, that the best investment for me was, was sending me back to that treatment center because the place wasn't cheap. I mean, it was, it was a nice place. Um, so I would think that that was a pretty good investment. But for me personally, um, I think taking those first, you know, I remember being in treatment early on and they were talking about sending me to the extended care facility, you know, which would be just an extension of my, my treatment. And of course, there was that little voice inside of me that was like, no, nah, you don't need to do all that. You need to get back to your life. But the more saner part of me came, you know, one and was like, 
you had messed your life up so bad that you really have nothing to go back to. You don't have a wife, you don't have kids, you don't have a job, you're not in school. Like, I had, I had nothing, which was actually a blessing. Because I could just go there and I could just devote a year of my life, that first year, to, like, recovery. Um, I just said I'm going to take a long view approach. And what is a year in a lifetime? You know, it's a drop in the bucket for most people. So I was like, what else, what else do you have to lose than to invest in yourself for this year? You know, try to you know, get back into shape, start eating right. I got back into school, you know, and that, that first year of investment, just giving myself that, that, that time frame, like, okay, give yourself the time to see if things can really change for you. You know, I was skeptical about recovery. I knew I didn't want to keep living where I was living, but I, I was terrified about being sober. So I was like, just give yourself this year of just going at this thing all out and see where you are. And it was only, you know, it was a matter of like four or five months when I started to realize that this is how I wanted to live my life. It was amazing. I mean, it took a little while, but, you know, I, I quickly realized that, that this was going to be a very good investment. And what does music mean to you? Oh, man. Music is like, it's been like the imaginary friend that you have with you your whole life that you kind of talk to, like when you're quiet and you're to yourself. I've just always, it's always been there. It, I remember when I was a little kid, um, my parents had these really cool instruments from a lot, a lot of different countries and stuff and different musical, you know, dulcimers and you know, mandolins and different kind of percussive instruments. They were mostly for like, they were just cool artifact type things, but I like, I realized when I was little that if I pressed on them and hit them in different places that I could make different sounds. And I was fascinated by that. And I remember when I was, I think it was like 1992, I uh, was riding in my car with my dad, and he put on a tape of Paul Simon's Graceland. And I had listened to, you know, music before that. I, at this point, at that point, I was you know, about eight years old. And that album, to me, um, it totally blew my mind, completely wide open. The different sounds and the different things that he was doing on the album and the, and the storytelling of the lyrics and the, the worldliness of, of the music on that album, it just completely captivated me. And I remember listening to the words and not knowing what they meant, but I remember being able to like conjure up my own imagery in my head about what he was singing about. And it just was so fascinating to me and it was such a nice escape. And from then on out, it was just this thing that has always been with me. Like, whether it's listening to it or making it. I started my first, I was in a band, my first band, I was in fourth grade, and I've been playing ever since. And my dream has always been, since I've started to know what computers are and, and stuff like that is, and production is, my dream is, and like once I like discovered hip-hop production and hip-hop beats, like I've been, that's something I want to do my whole life, was to produce. And then, over the past few years, I've slowly accumulated, you know, the gear and the place and the, the knowledge to be able to put out music on my own, and that's what I've been doing, you know, for the past year. Awesome. And how did music play into your kind of recovery, um, yeah. and did it help you at all to kind of, yeah, get sober or stay sober in any way? Yeah, for sure. I think one of the most important things for me and in my recovery has been to find purpose. And early on, it was, uh, you know, I, I wanted to be in really good shape. So that like, gave me purpose to take care of myself and get good sleep and get up in the morning and eat right and to not smoke cigarettes and not do drugs and stuff like that. And then I became a student. So that was a lot of purpose. Uh, and, and for me, you know, music is a huge thing that I find a lot of purpose in. I, like I said, if I take care of myself, then I, I can have trust that the faith that the music is coming from an authentic place. Um, so, we having the energy and the, the sharp sharpness of mind that comes from you know 
working out and meditating and things like that, the more I do that, usually the clearer I am and the, the easier it is for me to you know, make cohesive good music. Yeah, and you now kind of do some work as a recovery coach. What does that look like in your life now? And how is it sort of working in this industry and helping other people in a similar situation to us? Yeah, and that's another thing that I, I you know, find purpose in is to, to try to help people on their journey because, you know, I, I'm not saying that I had an easy road by any means, but I had a lot of help, no doubt, and I had a lot of resources, and there are a lot of people that aren't as fortunate. So I feel like if I can be that help and that support for other people, it kind of balances the scales back. You know what I'm saying? Like I, I took and took and took from society and from people for so long. You know, it's, it's kind of feels it like it's like almost a purpose to kind of bring those scales back and to help people who might not have had as much fortune as I had. Is there any valuable resources that you want to share in terms of like books or podcasts or online meetings or? Any books that you found helpful or any other sort of tools or things you use to help overcome your addiction? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, there's an app called FitMind, F-I-T-M-I-N-D. That's what I've gotten into recently. It's a meditation app, and that's completely changed my life. And it's changed other people's lives that I've shown it to as well. Um, but that is, that's been great. A book called The Untethered Soul. Um, that was a super helpful book. Um, I'm looking at all those over there. Um, for me, like, there's, there's a book called No More Mr. Nice Guy. That was a good book. Um, Waking Up by Sam Harris. Um, Russell Brand has a really good, probably the, his recovery book, Recovery from Our Addiction. That was an amazing book. It was a 12-step approach to recovery. Um, yeah, yeah probably that that in mind after because that's something you can do for every day. And that book that was that's been great. Thanks very much for all of the resources. I'll link them all down below so our audience can click them and find them. I just wondered if you wanted to send our audience anywhere to look more about the stuff you're up to and your awesome music, which I listen to, um, or anything like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I perform under the name Catch the Rise. Catch the Rise, like catch, like C-A-T-C-H. Um, and, yeah, if you just find, you know, Google that, and there's a website, there's all my social media, there's all my streaming profiles, uh, yeah, Google Catch the Rise, and you can find everything right there on Instagram, Facebook, all the stuff. So, yeah, please check it out if you're into, like, electronic uh, down-tempo music. Uh, a lot of people say that and I'm, I've been influenced by Tycho a good bit, um, Lane 8, Bass Nectar, Explosions in the Sky, those types of bands. Awesome. And was there anything else you wanted to add or anything else you had on your mind? No, I just, uh, you know, want to say thank you for, and I'm really grateful that there are people like you who are spreading the message of recovery. I think it's really important because, you know, the, the headlines can read very negatively. Uh, there's a lot of positives that come out of recovery and substance abuse and stuff like that. So thank you. Yeah, thank you for the compliment and thank you very much for, yeah, coming on the podcast been amazing and thanks for all the work you do helping people like us um it's really amazing and lastly i wanted to just thank our audience for coming uh, and listening to the podcast and just remember to subscribe on itunes we have new episodes out weekly every friday and please leave a rating so that we can get ranked better um in itunes and more people like you can find the podcast and if you love the episode which i'm sure you did if you could please share the podcast on Facebook and all the places you feel comfortable. And thanks again. And as always, I wish you well on your journey in recovery.